Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today to talk about the outcome in Turkey's local election, which was held last Sunday. I'm Blaise Mishtal, Jens is Vice President for Policy, uh, and I am uh, delighted and honored, as always, to be joined by uh, the, the godfather of uh, Turkish studies here, here in D.C., uh, Alan Mikofsky, uh, a fellow at Center for American Progress and a member of Jinsa's uh, Eastern Mediterranean Policy Task Force uh, and uh, a longtime Turkey hand uh, State Department official, uh, the chief Middle East staffer uh, for the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, and uh, uh, I guess the teacher uh, to all all current Turkey experts, uh, everyone has uh, has learned from Alan. So there's no better source uh, for us to learn from today and trying to, to understand what happened uh, in the elections and, and, and what significance it might have. Uh, I guess, Alan, maybe if I could just start by asking you to, to tell us a little bit about the result that's being cast as uh, as a loss for Erdogan, but he wasn't running specifically, right? These were uh, local elections. So could you tell us a little bit about what, what the outcome was? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Erdogan was not on the ballot. He was campaigning for his party's candidates, um, but his name did not appear anywhere on the ballot. Um, well, first, actually, maybe it's worth saying how winners and losers are determined. Um, there are a number of ballots that are cast when Turkey has local elections. Uh, one is for mayor, uh, another is for a municipal consul, in some cases, a provincial consul. Um, there are other smaller elections going on. So there are various ways to measure this. But the way it is commonly measured is who wins the most mayorships of provincial capitals. There are 81 provinces in Turkey, yeah, each with its uh, own capital, of course. And... Um, and what the percentage of the vote was. Uh, and by both of those measures, the long time and long suffering opposition party, the Republican People's Party, known as JHP and its uh, CHP or JHP and its Turkish initials, um, won uh, clearly. Um, this was an earthquake. Uh, Erdogan's party, the AKP, had won by, at least by my rough count, 17 consecutive elections. If you include national elections, nationwide local elections, presidential elections, referenda, um, they were undefeated. Uh, and um, the opposition won. Uh, they took 35 provincial mayorships um, uh, compared with uh, AKP's 24. And among those mayorships that uh, CHP, the opposition party, the secular opposition party, won, were Turkey's five largest cities, um, its most well-known cities, Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, Bursa, Antalya, Adana, um, uh, um, and in the overall vote total, uh, they won by more than two percentage points with, um, uh, to be fairly precise, 37.8% to uh, AKP's 35.5%. So it was a, um, you know, by, I, I wouldn't call it a landslide by uh, objective um, uh, criteria, um, but it's an earthquake to stay geological. I don't know if you can have an earthquake and no landslide, but um, uh, it was unexpected. Um, Erdogan, uh, just 10 months ago, had won the presidency in what some considered an upset. Um, and his party had was once again the largest party in parliament and their coalition, his, along with his coalition partner, the nationalist uh, party known as the Nationalist Action Party or Nationalist Movement Party. Um, uh, they hold a majority in parliament. And prior to the election Sunday, uh, I, most people expected 
that there was not going to be anything dramatic happening. The big focus was really on Istanbul, um, which the opposition had won in the last local elections in 2019. And that was considered a huge upset uh, at the time. And the question was, would its mayor, um, Ekremi Mamalu, be able to get reelected and thus retain viability to run for president uh, four years from now, many people consider him a uh, likely to be a very strong challenger, uh, whether he runs against Erdogan, which I, I think it's unlikely Erdogan will run again, um, uh, or anyone else. So, of course, Imamalu won big, but some other mayors won even bigger. And the big story was uh, in overshadowing Imamalu's victory in some ways was the nationwide uh, victory of the opposition in many, many places. Yeah, so I was going to just maybe push back a little bit or play devil's advocate on this idea of a big victory, because as you mentioned, uh, the JHP, the opposition candidate, already won Istanbul in, in the previous municipal elections. It's so so he was, you know, as the incumbent was reelected, the same in Izmir, the same in a lot of these municipalities Ankara. that Ankara, that the JHP won. It was just the incumbent winning re-election. So, um, you know, how much of this is really something new and a, and a new political wave? Or how much is this just, um, you know, sort of a steady increase in uh, in the local strength of, of, of the Jihad? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's an important question. Um, look, in 2019, Turkey holds nationwide local elections every five years, like clockwork. There's no such thing as early elections. Um, in 2019, when, as you mentioned, the opposition won many of uh, Turkey's big cities, um, overall, they won 21 provincial capitals and got 30 percent of the vote. Um, this time they won 35 provincial capitals. Uh, and got 38% of the vote. Meanwhile, AK Party's totals fell from uh, uh, from 39 provincial capitals to 24, and its overall vote fell from 43% to 36%. Um, and nine in nine different provincial capitals, uh, there was a flip from an AK Party mayor to a uh, opposition mayor. Um, and the uh, the reverse happened in only one provincial capital. So it, it, it is quite a change. And actually, if you want to look at the trend longer term, um, two sets of elections ago, uh, AK Party won 48 uh, mayorships and CHP won only 14. And now, as I said, AK Party only has half that many of 24, and uh, CHP has more than doubled its total um, to 35. Let me maybe argue the, the opposite side of that that now um, and, and maybe ask not so much about the result, but about the process. Uh, you know, I, I think for, for many of us, we've, we've, you know, the assumption has long been that uh, elections in Turkey aren't free and fair. Erdogan tries to tip the scales. Um, certainly there, that's been the perception in, in some of the national elections. But if we think back to the last local election, uh, where, as you said, Imam Olu won this upset taking the Istanbul mayorship, uh, Erdogan refused to accept that. He forced a, a, a second election, a, a rerun of the election, because he, he didn't want to accept it. Uh, so is the fact of this victory uh, despite the fact that Erdogan might have been trying to tip the scales, the fact that Erdogan isn't seeking to contest or re over overturn the results, uh, an indication of, of Erdogan's waning power or, or, or waning grip on the system? I, I, I think it is. Look, I think he is wounded by this. Um, I wouldn't say he's enfeebled, but he is seriously uh, wounded. Certainly the aura of invincibility um, uh, punctuated, as I said, by 17 consecutive victories, um, that has been pierced, um, perhaps more than pierced. It's been destroyed. Um, now, what I would not infer from that uh, is that he 
will um, be significantly less powerful. Uh, I think um, he still and the presidency, which has largely been crafted by Erdogan himself um, and through his constitutional amendments, uh, is a very powerful presidency. And Erdogan still has a lot of power, but um, I think a little less so. And, you know, I this may be getting into the weeds a little bit, but staying with the local elections, after the 2019 elections, um, which as we discussed, uh, uh, the opposition won some major mayorships in several of those places, including Istanbul and Ankara, Erdogan's party retained the majority on the municipal council, which tended to hamstring what uh, the mayors wanted to do. This time, um, CHP, the opposition party, won most of those municipal councils, including in Istanbul and Ankara. Uh, maybe, Alan, I could ask you about some of the other parties in the vote, because you know, it's a, it's a multi-party system in, uh, in Turkey. And uh, as you said, 37% for CHP, 35% for, uh, for AKP. There's, there's another 30 or so percent that, that voted for, for other parties. Uh, did those votes sort of go mostly along the same lines that they have in previous elections? Were there were there any surprises in what how other smaller parties performed? Yeah, I think that there was. Um, uh, first of all, um, the party that came in third with a little over six percent of the vote uh, was a party called the New Refah Party. It's a religious party to the right of Erdogan. Um, they won two mayorships, uh, but they maybe more significantly than that, they siphoned off the vote uh, from Erdogan's party in a number of provinces. Um, it, let me, just for context, um, mention what happened in the national elections uh, in uh, May of last year, uh, Erdogan did a very effective job of gathering all the right wing party, all the right wing religious parties under his umbrella. Um, this time they ran separately. And uh, this new Refah party, Yeni, Yeni Den Refah in Turkish, um, did not stick with Erdogan. They ran their own candidates. Um, and there was also there's also another party which arguably is even to the right of um of the new Rafah party, uh, because it seems to have its roots in a an Islamist terrorist organization uh from the late 20th century, a party called Hudapar. Uh, it's based in the Kurdish areas in the east and southeast. Um uh, they also ran, they took about, uh, I believe nationally, um, uh, only took about 1%, um, but they were instrumental in siphoning off some votes uh, in some provinces. There were, if every vote that went to the new Rafah party and Hudapar, these two very extreme Islamist parties, if they had gone to Erdogan's party instead, Erdogan would have won five more mayor, provincial mayorships. Uh, so, um, what, what accounts for the shift? Why, why, why did voters uh, vote for these? I, I assume it was sort of protest parties or shift away from the AKP. Yeah, well, I, it seems to be two issues. Um, one of them is was general to the electorate, and probably, although we haven't gotten into it, it's probably the main uh, factor in the entire election, which was is Turkey's faltering economy. Inflation, official inflation rate at 69%. Um, at the same time, interest rates are very high. The currency is falling. Um, people, are, uh, people are suffering. And that was that probably more than anything explains the overall result, including the opposition vote, and was a reason that 
many religious people opted to place their ballot with somebody with a a, a different religious party other than Erdogan's. But it also seems to be the case that Gaza is a big factor. Um, and this may seem surprising to um, uh, to many people in your audience who I think are aware how strong rhetorically uh, Erdogan, how, how strongly rhetorically Erdogan has criticized Israel and, um, you know, calling Netanyahu Hitler and uh, calling the Israelis the modern Nazis and also, of course, uh, um, staunchly defending Hamas. Uh, but these parties criticized him that he hasn't done enough, that he hasn't broken relations with Israel, uh, that he hasn't stopped trade with Israel. Um, and, uh, and that seems to have been a big vote getter um, particularly for the new Rafah party. By the way, the new Rafah party uh, is led by a man named Fatih Erbakan. He is, that may, that last name may be familiar to some of your audience. His father, his late father, Nejmetin Erbakan, was Turkey's first Islamist-oriented prime minister and um, uh, from 1996 to 97 and was um, no different than his son in terms of his attitudes towards Israel. By the way, the party, I, I should add, is not only anti-Israel, it's also anti-NATO, anti-US. Um, on, uh, on the more Islamist side of the spectrum, of course, it's very anti-LGBT, where Erdogan is basically found common ground with them, but they go farther, further. They um, uh, would like to see Turkey repeal its laws against um, uh, violence against wives and children. So um, they feel that the head of the household should have the right to use violence uh, against his own family members. So um, they base on their interpretation of Islam. So it's a pretty extreme party, but it played a big factor in this election. Let me just make one other point that's kind of interesting. Um, Erdogan traditionally, as I said, has held the right together. And he um, suffered at the polls, his party suffered at the polls for the fractionalization of the right. On the other hand, um, people thought that the opposition, whose coalition in the national elections in May of last year, broke up entirely. People thought that would be a major factor, but it turned out that it wasn't. Um, and uh, one of the most interesting aspects uh, in uh, was that the Kurdish party, which refrained from running candidates 10 years ago, uh, 10 months ago, I'm sorry, um, in the national election, uh, in order to help CHP in order to help the secular opposition party. This time they ran their own candidates, but Kurds, uh, Kurdish voters seem to get how to do it strategically. And it seems that in, in Istanbul, for example, and many other places where the CHP candidate needed the votes, um, a majority, perhaps a majority, a clearly significant numbers of Kurds did not vote for the pro-Kurdish party, but rather voted for CHP. So um, is your sense that's the result of any sort of coordination or or just Kurdish voters learning how to how to vote strategically? Because as you said, in the national election, and I guess what is how is the CHP realigning on the Kurdish issue as well? Because uh, in the national election, as you said, the HDP didn't run a candidate, but it wasn't invited to be part of the coalition with the CHP and other opposition parties, right? It was sort of sure. off to the side because it was seen as p potentially politically uh, in injurious to the CHP to be a in an official alliance with the HDP. Um, right. So has there been any sort of shift on the political optics of, of, of the opposition working with the Kurds? Yeah, look, there could have been some coordination behind the scenes. I mean, um, in Istanbul, uh, um, 
Well, to, to, to your point about the Kurds not having been included, um, yes, many Kurds were unhappy that they were um, kind of uh, treated as outsiders. They weren't formally part of the coalition um, in uh, 2023. Um, and they ran a significant party person for mayor in Istanbul, uh, but it's there could have been some coordination. They didn't run their best candidate uh, there, and um, who, by the way, probably would have been the wife of the their jailed the jailed founder of the pro Kurdish party, Salahuddin Demirtas. Um, uh, so there was some sense that maybe by not running their best candidate, they were trying to help CHP, but it also seemed like the Kurds showed a lot of sophistication. There may have been some coordination, but, you know, primarily um, it was seemed to be that the Kurds knew how to use their vote most effectively. Now, will it help them in the future? Um, some people noticed that uh, Imam Alou in his victory speech, when he thanked various people, he thanked several groups, and he mentioned the Kurds by name, which um, this may be sad to say, but is somewhat of a big deal in Turkey, um, that he thanked them. He has also um, been critical of the Turkish government, um, which has replaced in the past many elected, uh, matter of fact, most elected Kurdish mayors uh, from the Kurdish majority areas, they have re replaced them with what they call trustees, Kayum and Turkish, um, uh, on security grounds. Um, so, uh, because the Turkish government claims the party is very close with the PKK. So, I, I, I guess let me uh, ask you bigger picture, Alan. Does the any of this matter for Turkey's direction? I mean, these are local local elections, mayors, local councils. Uh, Erdogan maintains his grip on national power. None of that changed in this election. Uh, maybe, as you said, he's been uh, you know the the aura of invincibility has been has been punctured. But there's four years until the next national election, which is a long time, long time, a long time for him to reassert control, re rejigger, uh, maybe rejigger the system if he needs to. Uh, and, and he, as you said, I mean, he was challenged by the opposition party, but he was also challenged on his right. So, um, I mean, th does this, if anything, force him to, to move further to the right and, and stave off uh, the, the, the fractionalization of his support there? I mean, how does, how does this change sort of Turkey's overall national level political yeah. dynamics? Well, there may be a bit to that about moving to the right domestically. Look, I, I think his hope domestically is that the economic plan um, that they have in place, which is still rather new, will by four years from now be have the economy humming. Um, so I think he hopes that will take care of a big chunk of his problem. Um, I think two big effects, uh, one domestically, one foreign. Um, Domestically, I think he had hoped to, and he had spoken about it, so I don't have to only think it. He had hoped um, to uh, bring a new constitution to Turkey, possibly one that would allow him to run again, because actually he's in his last term under this constitution with one minor exception. Um, and uh and I think this result affects the possibility of him doing that constitution. He would need at least 60% of parliament um, to bring a constitutional measure to a referendum. Um, and uh, uh, he would need two thirds of parliament um, in order to actually just pass it without a referendum. He's far from that. He's got about 52% with his coalition partner. Um, I don't think he's gonna be able to do this constitution or any of his amendments. And by the way, 
the only way that he could do early elections, again, if the Constitution is going to be followed, um, the only way that Erdogan could get an additional term is if 60 percent of parliament vote to have new early elections. Um, and I don't think that's likely. I mean, I, I think the odds, it may not have been likely anyway, but I think it's less likely now because parties, the parties he would need to bring in to bolster his current support in parliament um, are more likely to see him as a sinking ship. And I don't think they're like, likely to want to help him out. The other effect in um, foreign policy, look, I, Erdogan's going to want to change the subject. Um, and I think we do have to keep an eye uh, on what he's likely to do to change the subject. Um, he's a little bit hamstrung by the fact that uh, he has a visit to the White House coming up May 9th. I believe that's not been confirmed by the White House, but it seems to have been confirmed on background by uh, a number of U.S. officials, and it's been stated by Turkish officials. Um, I think he's not going to want to upset the apple cart before that, but um, he may do a big operation in Iraq against the PKK, uh, something very big that would be a major problem for the U.S., of course, would be an operation, which he has long threatened to do, um, in uh, Syria, uh, where the U.S. is partnering with a Kurdish group against ISIS. Um, and Erdogan considers the Kur our partners, the U.S. partners, to be part of the PKK and therefore a terrorist group. Um, I don't think he can really do anything in the Aegean to stir things up with Greece. Uh, he could, of course, but um, the recent uh, agreement of Congress to let him have F-16, plus 40 new F-16 planes, I think would, would go down the tubes if he did anything on that score. And there's been a rapprochement with Greece lately, which I, I expect to hold uh, for the sake of Erdogan getting those, for Turkey getting uh, those F-16s. But um, he'll certainly want to change the subject. And um, I know you were running out of time, aren't we? Uh, I No, no, we can, I, um, we can run a little over here. I, I just wanted to make sure um, before uh, before we um, sign off to mention that uh, although the Kurdish party, because so many of their partisans voted for CHP, um, lost its overall vote, uh, its overall vote declined to from about eight and a half percent to around five percent, eight and a half percent of the national elections last year to about five percent. Um, it still won. Uh, I believe it was 10 provincial mayorships in Kurdish majority areas um, and it is contesting a few others. And it, actually, um, there's been quite a bit of controversy. The mayor of Vaughan, occurred from the pro-Kurdish party, won and it, it did win in a landslide. He won 55%. Um, he subsequently, and the number two uh, um, candidate was from Erdogan's party with 27%. So it was basically two to one. Right after the election, the winning candidate was declared um, ineligible on security grounds. That was after he had already been approved on security grounds before the election. Um, uh, there were huge demonstrations um, because of that. And the higher election board in Turkey actually overturned the decision that ruled him ineligible and declared him the winner. Um, but as a result, there's now an investigation of some of the judges who did the overruling. So we have to stay tuned. Um, uh, there are two or three places where it appears, or at least the Kurds claim, that having lost a very close vote, that soldiers 
and policemen from outside their area were sent in to vote and that their votes made the difference. Um, and, you know, as I've mentioned, uh, even the Kurdish mayors who have won legitimately, the, the, to be more precise, the Kurdish mayors from the pro-Kurdish party, because there are Kurds in other parties, um, most of them are have been declared ineligible following the last two elections and ultimately replaced. And I think that's a big problem. I would certainly hope that the Biden administration, which has been trying to pursue a pragmatic policy, um, what it sees as a pragmatic policy towards Turkey these days, certainly hope that they would make a major issue uh, of protecting the sanctity of the Kurdish vote um, and of those who were elected fairly um, when Erdogan visits at the White House on May 9th. So there's a lot Thanks. more to talk about, but um, I know I think yeah. we, we were going to go 30 yeah, minutes. Well, I, well, I want to just uh, follow up with, with one question for you oh, and, sure. and in case there are any questions from the audience. If sure, you sure, want to sure. submit them using the, the, the Q&A feature, we can run mm. a couple minutes extra. Um, you know, but Alan, you were talking about the different areas in which uh, Erdogan might might lash out, uh, or you know, maybe try to distract from his domestic troubles uh, by stirring things up, uh, as he has in the past. Uh, I wanted to raise two potential areas that you didn't mention. Um, you referred to you know potentially taking action against uh, PKK or Kurdish groups in Iraq and Syria, uh, but what about the domestic? uh sort of uh arena and the potential for more crackdowns against the, the the kurds beyond just the electoral shenanigans that you were talking about um and then also given that you had talked about you know how the new rafa party was um at least in part buoyed by its claims that erdogan wasn't doing enough uh to, to support hamas or to fight the israelis uh you know we we've heard talks in recent days that uh uh, IHH, the, the humanitarian group uh, that was responsible for the Mavi Marmara uh, flotilla uh, in, in 2010 might be trying to, right, to put together. Right, it's always been a very uh, pro-Hamas group. Yeah. Has been a very pro-Hamas group, might be trying to put together another flotilla. Um, would, would that or some other, uh, you know, anti-Israel uh, actions uh, potentially be in the pipeline for Erdogan? I think now? that's, uh, I think that sounds plausible. Um, I think it, Look, I, the restraint on Erdogan is that he seems to want to calm the waters for now with the United States. Um, but um, yes, I certainly wouldn't rule that out, that uh, a float, another flotilla effort along those lines, uh, along the lines of what we remember from the Mavi Marmara, and that's certainly possible. Um He's a, Erdogan's a pretty creative and unpredictable guy, so I'm not sure what it will be, but um, there will be something. And I'm sorry, the first question was? Uh, sort of the domestic Kurdish uh, ah, towards, potential yeah. crackdown. Um, look, I think there's an ongoing crackdown with the Kurds. If we're talking about free speech, if we're talking um, about uh, arresting people for um being activists for Kurdish rights in Turkey um uh and you know so I think that type of crackdown is ongoing but isn't quite as splashy in Turkey um as uh as a military operation would be and it does seem to me I mean there was a time when, the PKK insurgency, and it has been an insurgency, there's always debate about what the right term is. They're an insurgency that has often, particularly in the past, used terrorist methods, and they are on the terrorist list in the United States, in the European Union, um, as well as in Turkey. Uh, but there was a time when a lot of the fighting went on inside Turkey, and it seems that Turkish military successes have largely driven that military aspect of the fight outside of Turkish borders um, to Iraq, where the PKK is based. And actually, Turkey recently signed an agreement uh, with the government in Baghdad, which it seems will 
um, allowed Turkey um, great freedom of action uh, in terms of uh, pursuing the PKK in, in Iraq. So I, I think that is a possibility, and that's something that it does get a lot of attention in Turkey, certainly. Um, by the way, maybe it's not maybe it's too much in the weeds again, but another interesting sidelight, I thought, on the Kurds. I, I mentioned that in the last election, the national election in 23, they stepped aside, didn't run candidates for the sake of helping CHP. Um, it's ironic, and this time they did run candidates. It's ironic this um, approach was the more effective. In the 2023 election, the fact that they didn't run candidates helped, uh, allowed Erdogan to brand CHP as effectively a pro-PKK group, because it seems so clear there was cooperation going on, even though it wasn't formal. The fact that the Kurdish party did run candidates this time, it, it the, the AKP people continued to make that argument, but I think it just, it didn't penetrate very much because after all, there on the ballot was proof that, uh, seeming proof that there was no cooperation between CHP and the Kurdish party. It was uh, because they were running against each other. I hope that well, wasn't too in the weeds, but I thought it was an interesting yeah. counterintuitive um, uh, result of this election. No, as always, a, a brilliant insight, Alan, for, for which we, we thank you and, and appreciate all of the insights you've brought today. And uh, maybe in a month or so, as uh, Erdogan's visit to the White House in years, we can we can have you on again to discuss the state of U.S.-Turkish relations and, and what we could expect from that meeting. Uh, but thanks for joining us, Alan. Thanks to, to everyone who, who tuned in this morning. Uh, let me just put in a, a plug since uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be marking this, this uh, weekend, the, the sad uh, six-month anniversary of the October 7th attack. Uh, on Monday uh, at 3.30 Eastern time, we'll have a, a webinar to, to mark that occasion and talk about uh, where things stand in the war. And I think in particular, as we're seeing, uh, where things stand with the growing uh, rift in, in U.S. Uh, and Israel relations about the war. Uh, we'll feature uh, Mike Mikofsky, John Hanna, uh, Generals uh, Aish and Norkin and Amador. So it'll be a terrific lineup. I encourage all of you to, to RSVP. Uh, with that, thank you again for joining. Uh, thank, thank you, you very Alan. much. I, I did just want to say that um, we could easily reverse this with me asking the questions and you giving the answers huh. because... Uh, you're certainly one of the top Turkey analysts in town, too. So thank well, you. Very well, much. I appreciate that. That's only because everything I know I learned from you. But 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 thanks, Alan. Um, and wishing everyone a good good Sabbath. Thank, thank you. you, everyone.